Hello, everybody. I have the pleasure to host today on the IVF Worldwide Webinar Platform, our friend, Professor Bart Fazer, who is known to all of us. Bart is a professor of reproductive medicine, former head of the Department of Reproductive Medicine and Gynecology, and chair of the Division of Women and Baby at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Obstetric and Gynecology, honorary member of the ASHRAE, member of the National Academy of Medicine, member of the board of the Dutch Medicine Research Council, and executive board member of the IFFS. He was the editor-in-chief of Human Reproduction Update, and currently he is the editor-in-chief of RBM Online. But major research interests include the pathophysiology of human ovarian function, PCOS, Hematur ovarian failure, IVF, and women's health. He has published over 450 peer reviews articles, and his work has been widely covered in the national and international press. And today, his presentation is about how to define a successful IVF program. Hello, Bart. But before we start with the presentation, I would like to take the privilege of being the host of this session and just have a short discussion with you to learn about your thoughts about a few things that I think might be interest to all of us. And the first one, can you please share with us the current situation in the Netherlands and if there are any fertility treatment like IUI, IVF, diagnostic procedure like hysterosapiographia or hysteroscopy? Okay, in, in the Netherlands, uh, we went through uh, a quite difficult uh, phase. Uh, let's say the last four or five weeks, uh, we have been uh, uh, <clears throat> updated by our prime minister uh, two, three times a week. Uh, uh, very, very serious. And, and we are in what he refers to as an intelligent lockdown which uh, means that we, we are allowed to leave our houses, uh, but only, uh, only of course, certain uh, uh, jobs are exempt from that, uh, healthcare workers, of course, but some others. Uh, but for the rest, uh, we are all uh, uh, seriously uh, motivated to stay home as much as possible. Uh, so only for shopping, for groceries, uh, we are discouraged to visit our, our older uh, relatives, our parents, uh, uh, of course, uh, next to older people, handicapped people are, are uh, seriously endangered. Uh, I have a handicapped son, uh, so that's uh, something that I have to take care of very uh, seriously. Uh, but these measures uh, have been successful in terms of uh, three, four weeks ago, uh, people predicted that the whole healthcare system would go bust uh, and that we would need many more intensive care units than we actually have or that we could uh, create the new ones that, that we could create. Uh, so people were talking about uh, two and a half thousand intensive care units for our country. That was the maximum it could be stretched and that would not be enough. Uh, so there have been heavy debates and, and, of course, issues about money and building a new intensive care units and having all the equipment uh, being uh, uh, ordered uh, abroad. But the good uh, news is that over the last, uh, I, I guess, the last week, we did not see a serious increase. Uh, so the number of intensive care uh, patients uh, diagnosed with the, the coronavirus is about 1,400 and it's, it's, it's fairly stable now. So of course people uh, die and people are released from the intensive care. So over the last week or so, five days, we did not see a further increase. But still we are pretty seriously uh, hurt by this condition. Uh, the number of, of people who deceased from corona is uh, considerable. But and the other issue is that we uh, uh, don't uh, diagnose, don't test uh, individuals systematically. 
So probably what we know and the figures we see in our national registries of corona-related death is a growth underestimation. And if we would look at reality, real life uh, uh, death related to corona, it's probably at least double the, the, the official figures. So again, the good news is uh, <clears throat> it seems to be under control. Uh, the bad news is, of course, the economy, and the bad news is that people are getting impatient. Uh, you know, four weeks in lockdown situation. Uh, so everybody uh, believes that this is not sustainable for much longer. So how to try to find the right balance? Uh, and that certainly also relates to infertility uh, care. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it is not surprising when you know the Dutch culture uh, that, of course, one of the first uh, uh, elective medicine uh, interventions uh, that can be stopped is infertility treatment uh, or diagnostics. Uh, and that indeed has taken place about a month ago. So no infertility interventions whatsoever. And even now, uh, today, um, uh, even when people start talking about uh, re collateral damage, uh, which other areas of medicine have been hurt by this uh, serious uh, corona uh, pandemic, uh, like uh, oncology diagnosis, like uh, kidney transplantation patients, uh, like uh, acute cardiac failure diagnosis, uh, this has all been reduced to half over the last couple of weeks. And that's, of course, not because the disease has been less uh, prominent, but it's just because uh, people were afraid to go to the hospital or, or they didn't want to have, have burdened the system even further. So there has been a gross underdiagnosis. And, and certainly I've been trying in a subtle manner to bring infertility treatment in the... Uh, 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 make people aware of that for some patients uh, there is no time left and, and they cannot wait uh, in, in, in terms of oncofertility and certainly also in terms of the, the, the women with more advanced reproductive age. Uh, but until now this is really under the radar and, and, and what people say because reproductive care or infertility care is usually uh, almost exclusively done in hospital settings in my country and one of the big arguments is, of course, uh, resources. That uh, the corona epidemic has been, uh, 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 takes so much effort and so much uh, people, and also in the triage, uh, so that many doctors from other areas, uh, including gynecology and reproduction, they, they, they got uh, involved in, in corona care or corona screening. Uh, so they say, you know, these people, we, we need these people to, to live up to expectations and to give the best of care to, to potential corona uh, uh, affected people. So uh, it's a difficult discussion. And nationally, it is slightly different because, or internationally because infertility care, of course, in, in the great, great majority of countries is predominantly performed in the private setting. So there, the argument that you need these healthcare workers to help the corona pandemic uh, uh, being managed uh, does not apply because they don't work in a hospital setting. And there you see more and more people. And now also you have more and more patients and patient organizations that stand out and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is also devastating for us. Uh, and let's look uh, which kind of fertility care, infertility care could resume uh, and, and when is this going to happen? So less stringent uh, than Dutch and national, net less stringent than ASHRAE and ASRM uh, guidelines. But this is a difficult message uh, for some. And, and certainly as a chief editor of the journal RBM Online, uh, I've been following this uh, closely. We received uh, uh, some commentaries Actually, the first two were published last week. So if you're interested in the more uh, uh, concise way of evaluating the pros and cons and what should, what can be done, what cannot be done, uh, is uh, uh, so, so you, you can read the two first papers being published on this topic last week uh, in, in my journal.
So it's a difficult balance. Uh, and for sure, of course, safety first in everything and also in infertility care. And this, of course, is, uh, involves safety of parents, of safety of uh, the woman, the mother uh, to be, but of course, also safety of uh, uh, the child uh, to be. And uh, although initial observations reported from China, I saw a JAMA paper uh, just uh, released uh, uh, this weekend uh, on children born from corona infected uh, uh, pregnant uh, women. It seems, it, uh, I have to be careful, it seems uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, okay. So not, uh, no observations uh, that would give rise to major worries. Uh, but still, of course, this is very, very preliminary. So nobody at this stage would uh, uh, make a plea for resumption of infertility care overall, uh, or IVF for, for that matter. But you could think about uh, oncofertility, cryopreservation of, of, of gametes, uh, potentially embryos, uh, that those activities could resume again fairly safety, safely when you balance uh, the pros and cons. And, and the reports in the international literature has been especially, of course, women in their late 30s or early 40s that were in the midst of an IVF uh, uh, treatment. And, and we can easily understand that the delay, which could last uh, several months for those individuals using their own gametes, is not a realistic proposition. So we have to be very careful here in evaluating, again, the pros and cons in those particular circumstances. Thank you both That's for sharing this information with us. And I want further to ask you another two questions. One is, as editor-in-chief of RBM Online, what do you think would happen to all the current clinical studies that were stopped and how this will influence future publications? That's a very, very uh, a good question, a very relevant question. Uh, indeed, almost all infertility studies has been stopped throughout uh, the world. So there will be, you know, it, it, that, that's very costly, of course, uh, to stop a trial. Uh, um, it will take a lot of extra energy to resume these studies. And also, when can this be done? Probably the public opinion will say, you know, focus on patient care first and then wait with, uh, with in, in, uh, the reinitiation of trials. Uh, of course, it will mean that certainly prospective trials uh, uh, submitted for publication will, will reduce uh, in, in the, next, uh, for the next two or three years. Uh, and also, if you think about it statistically, of course, having prospective inclusion of patients, respective patients, then you have to stop for a given period of time and resume after whatever, uh, six months, 12 months, but also from a statistical point of view, uh, this may be uh, uh, problematic. On the other hand, we have to realize that you know, in, in everything which is published in reproduction, in infertility care, it is still more than 90% of papers being published are retrospective analysis. So in that respect, it will affect uh, high quality prospective uh, science. Uh, but uh, there will be enough uh, uh, issues uh, to address uh, for which there is no uh, prospective trials available. And with, before going to your lecture, just the last question. You're probably aware that we are doing quite a lot of surveys on IVF worldwide, and we notice that current clinical practice is different from evidence-based medicine as published in the literature. And I will give you just one a example, it's the use of progesterone. Just using progesterone to support the luteal phase and the continuation of the drug up to 10 to 12 weeks of gestation, where all studies show that it is not needed. You can stop administration progesterone uh, when you have a fetal heartbeat. And the other thing is, there are lots of study and meta-analysis showing that there is no difference between the different formulation of progesterone. 
you know, the IM, the subcutan, and now it's the oral. And still, people continue to use IM progesterone, which is known that she's very painful and low, the patients have local side effects. And, you know, it's very curious to know why, why there is such a difference between clinical practice and science. That's a very good question, Zef, and, and, and I'm aware of that. And, and to some extent, it relates to my presentation. Uh, I think in general, we can say that the clinicians are quite well informed. They are uh, aware of the, the well-designed, evidence-based uh, RCTs. Uh, but I think consciously or unconsciously, people who continue with doing it differently than what these studies suggest is that the, these results are not relevant uh, in, in their conditions. They are not relevant for their patients. And, and, and I think the words to be used here is context. That the context uh, where they uh, perform IVF or nutrient based supplementation is different. And whether that's valid or not is uh, an evaluation that we all have to make ourselves. Uh, but we have to realize that much of what we do is not based on, on evidence. And then, of course, you have to define the word evidence. Uh, what is evidence? And, and why is it relevant or not relevant in our particular condition? And again, I will probably address that in my, uh, my upcoming lecture. So thank you, Bart, and without further delay, you are most welcome to present your talk and slides now. Thank you. Okay, Seth. So, uh, indeed, uh, I was asked to, to talk about uh, uh, how to define successful IVF. And for the people that listen to this presentation, um, maybe this is the time to ask yourselves, how do I define successful IVF? What is the most relevant outcome measure? Because it seems such an obvious question. And at first glance, you may think, why even focus on this? It is so obvious. But when you start thinking about this, you will see that life is less uh, unidimensional. And therefore, and again, it relates to the discussion with Zef previously, if you think about the way IVF is practiced throughout the world, we all know that there are major regional differences. So this already uh, suggests that the way different, different uh, uh, continents in the world uh, define success uh, is, not so, it, is not so unified. And why is that? And what does it mean? So how do you get a handle on this? How can you make it objective and concrete uh, that you can say uh, what should be modified, what should be the next uh, steps? So, and I will try to, to take you through at least my world uh, and my view on this, uh, which I developed, let's say, over the last uh, decade. Uh, and again, ask yourself whether this is relevant in your particular situation. So my disclosure statements, uh, I will not go in detail. It has been mentioned in the, the introduction. Uh, I'm an emeritus professor. I'm involved in, in government bodies, in scientific journals, uh, in executive boards of big uh, in global organizations, uh, consultant for pharma companies and, and visiting professor. Uh, and let's start with a, with a very, very concrete uh, example. A friend of mine uh, had to undergo knee surgery uh, recently. Uh, and it started me thinking about outcome. So what would be an outcome, the desired outcome of knee surgery? And again, it seems very straightforward, isn't it? Uh, you know, there is a problem with your knee. You cannot move properly. It, 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 it's often painful. So you could easily uh, uh, think, you know, how to define uh, when a surgery is successful or not, isn't it? Okay, reality. What is an outcome for 
most uh, uh, of these individuals undergoing knee surgery. And in, again, m my friend is one of them. Uh, he was very, very pleased with the knee surgery because after this, he's out of pain. For him, it was very painful. Uh, and he was very happy being relieved from the pain. Although still functionally, he could stroll a little, he can stroll a little, but not much. Again, he's a very happy uh, uh, patient. But other patients that undergo knee surgery, they are, in, they are uh, used to go jogging. That's part of their lifestyle. That's part of what they have been doing. Uh, and of course, in the extreme uh, marathon uh, runners. Of course, if they would be relieved from the pain only, or maybe could stroll uh, along a shopping mall on the Sunday afternoon, uh, so the same outcome, they would be very un unhappy. Because what would be a desired outcome for them is that they could go jogging again. So even something pretty simple as this, uh, I think this example tells you that the individual uh, expectations or desires of outcomes may be quite different. And even with the same outcome, some patients may be very happy, whereas others are not. So we have to manage this expectation and make it explicit. When you talk about outcomes, it's quite often that also when I lecture about this, people come to me and say, why bother, you know, who cares about outcomes? Uh, I can tell you that I think it is one of the major uh, uh, issues now in healthcare in general about outcomes. Uh, and there are many developments uh, and there are seminars and courses, uh, health insurance companies, government bodies, they are all related to outcomes. Because why does a patient seek help from a healthcare system and what do they want to get out of it? So when are they happy or not? Uh, and you have, the, the, I think these are the three major developments now, the PROMS, the Patient Reported Outcome Measures. Uh, this is very much in, in terms of health insurance companies. So this is very much, again, focus on the patient. What does the patient want? And how can we organize care around the desires of patients? Then, and this became almost a religion, the value-based healthcare. Uh, Porter is the, the name associated with that. Uh, you know, a lot of current healthcare managers and board of director members of big hospitals in my country, they, they went to Porter courses, uh, Harvard uh, in Boston, of course. Uh, and, and this is very much also focused on outcomes relevant for patients, but also uh, at the, health, the, the, the health economics aspect. How can we get there as, as fast as possible, as easy as possible and as cheap as possible? So how can we organize, reorganize healthcare around the desire of patients and get there as efficient uh, as we want? And last but not least, and also it relates to Zef's uh, question, why don't we follow uh, what the guidelines or what the, the, the big RCTs uh, uh, dictate? Uh, now we also live in, a in, a, in the time of shared decision-making, uh, which means that we are more counselors uh, and together with patients, we jointly decide what is best for them, which again may not be the same as the outcome uh, of a big sample size RCT. So how does this relate to IVF? Uh, and we all know this, uh, the, the IVF leak tables, I think this was the first publication. Uh, can you see this? This is more than 20 years ago now uh, in the British Medical Journal where they compared uh, uh, life birth rates uh, for all individual clinics in the UK. And of course, you can easily imagine that if you are uh, somewhere up, somewhere around uh, in, in below, in, on, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, then you're very happy. But if you happen to be on one of the top uh, clinics with a very low pregnancy rate, you have a lot of explaining uh, to do uh, to patients, and you may not be so very happy where you are. So comparing uh, uh, outcomes, uh, uh, okay, but of course the key question is, how do we do this? And there are many, many uncertainties around this, again related to context, which patients do you treat, uh, 
which which is the average age of your patients, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which all is related to outcomes and not necessarily about the performance of the doctor and the performance of the lab. There has been an interesting debate series on this uh, in human reproduction uh, in 2004. Very, very interesting. It started with uh, a publication by uh, from the Melbourne group in, in Australia saying that they made a plea for using the best criteria, birth emphasizing a successful singleton at term. And it started the whole debate series. And you see here all the contributions uh, in bold. It's ours. I'll tell you later about this. But the interesting uh, uh, issue is that after one year of debate on successful outcome, the editor in chief at that time, uh, David Barlow, said, This discussion is leading nowhere. So let's stop from here. So not because we reached a consensus, but because it appeared impossible to reach a consensus. And I find this difficult to explain, for instance, to my, my lay public friends, my non-doctor friends, and they say, you know, how is it possible that for an intervention that you do, you cannot reach an agreement on, on, on how, or what is the parameter that we should compare uh, with? So what is the best outcome parameter? That's, again, Difficult to understand uh, for, for non-doctors. At that time, and I know it was pretty bold and, 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 and certainly very, very few people agreed, we said that in terms of improving outcome, we should not look at surrogate markers, but we should look at the whole treatment. So an integrated approach uh, of looking at outcomes. It's not the easiest way, but at the end of the day, we said at the time, it's the only way. And I think it's fair to say that in the, in the last 50 years after that, uh, developments are more and more going in this uh, direction, which we reported uh, in 2004. And when you talk about outcomes uh, in more concrete terms, this is uh, a publication from our uh, uh, quite controversial, international, esteemed peer, Norbert Leicher. He published in Fertility Sterility a paper where he compared the registry data of IVF US and Europe. And uh, his conclusion was, and it's shown here in the bar slide, uh, that uh, pregnancy rates per cycle, like birth rates per cycle, in the US was much higher in Europe. And he actually literally advice in that paper to consider for European uh, patients undergoing IVF treatment to consider to have their treatments in the US uh, because they said you know you have a one-third uh, uh, higher chance to, to for, for pregnancy compared to being treated in Europe and of course first I was challenged by this uh, I have to say in a way offended by this uh, so it got me thinking about what this is mean and is it really true? And let me start before I, I give you all different arguments that I have no reservation by, by agreeing that probably certainly at the time, labs in the IVF gave better results than labs in Europe. And there are studies to back this up that this is indeed true. But, uh, and I gave a presentation uh, on this uh, shortly after that, trying to digest what does it mean and what are the issues that should be considered? Uh, now, the first one is the definition of live birth. I will get to that later on. But usually live birth is being used as a surrogate, so to speak, for healthy children. And I think that's, that's wrong. That's not true. Again, I will get to that. Which patients are being treated? Of course, if you treat better prognosis patients, you will have better outcomes. Uh, and then, then it's, it does not represent the treatment, but it represent, represents the patient. And also patients have it like smoking, uh, you know, smoking in the US was banned at the time. And, and uh, uh, in those years, there were still about 15% uh, of patients in Europe undergoing IVF who were still smoking. We all know that this is not good for outcomes. Now, how about uh, uh, multiples and fetal reduction, so embryo transfer policy, how about complications like the OHSS? How about side effects, long-term risks, prior results? Uh, 
what is the start of cycle anyway, duration of the cycle, the cost of the cycle, and dropouts. Uh, relevant for cumulative uh, outcomes, but not for a single for a single cycle outcomes. And again, all those issues I will address uh, later on. But this was my first uh, thoughts uh, made public in a presentation in 2007. I think based on this presentation, I was invited uh, at the best of Ashray ASRM uh, in New York uh, just a couple of years ago to defend my standpoint. Uh, and this was in the US, uh, of course, focusing on US. Uh, uh, so how do you compare uh, IVF in Europe versus the US? And I, I did my own uh, analysis at the time. And you can see on the left-hand side, comparing US data, the most recent US data available at the time, that was 2012, uh, European data, European registry, 2010, you know, published in human reproduction annually, and our Dutch registry data, uh, 2013, just for reason of comparison. And when you look on your right-hand side, uh, when you look at pregnancy rates per cycle, when you really see in the US, it is live birth per cycle, in the EU, that's how it's registered in the EU, clinical pregnancy rate per aspiration, and when in the Netherlands already at the time, which was wide, single embryo transfer was widely applied, and uh, so, and, and we know now for sure, but already at the time, we had many children born for frozen embryos, because of course, if you transfer less, less embryos fresh, you will have more added value of your cryo program. So when in the Dutch circumstances, when you compare fresh and frozen together, then you see that pregnancy rates are identical in the US, EU, and the Netherlands. And not surprisingly, when you compare multiple pregnancy rates in those years, in the US, it is much higher compared to Europe, and especially in the Netherlands. You see that at that time, nationally, in the US, the multiple pregnancy rates was five to six times higher compared to the Netherlands. And today, in the Netherlands, multiple pregnancy rate following IVF is 1.3%, so virtually non-existent. So you see it's a nuance, and it's, it, it, it relates to how do you look at data, what parameters do you compare? Um, last year, in, in, in my journal, RBMO, we published the first uh, data from the African uh, content, uh, uh, from, from Africa continent uh, on IVF. You see it's a publication from Silke Dyer, and, and I, I dedicate an editorial to this, uh, that now, except for uh, the Asian Pacific region, we have registries uh, of IVF throughout the world. And I think we can truly be proud of that because we were one of the best registered medical procedures in the world. So that's the good news. The not so good news is, uh, and, and as you might expect, that all these registries, they look at slightly different endpoints. So apparently success rates and how to define success, uh, we did not agree upon uh, so far and therefore registries are different. So for sure, it's a lot better than nothing at all, but of course, it's also easy to conclude that we would gain a lot by defining uh, success first and then adjust all the national or re regional uh, registries uh, so that then we, uh, at least we have uh, data that we can really uh, compare in a reliable manner. And if you're interested, again, this was outlined in, in an editorial of mine last year in RBL. So, other aspects of IVF treatment outcome. So different issues that I would like to discuss with you. So what are these aspects that I think are relevant and that should be considered in greater detail? Life birth, what is a life birth and is this what we consider the best time endpoint? How about cost of IVF and its implication? How about cumulative outcomes rather than single procedure outcomes? How to assess new intervention? Because only if we agree on a definition of success, then we can assess 
improvement of outcomes by ad adjunct interventions. And I, I, I will go into this in a little detail. And then at the end, I would like to, to, to outline the more integrated approach, uh, again, which we uh, uh, published uh, for the first time in uh, 2004. So the international guidelines, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the international glossary, uh, a whole group of people, uh, WHO involved, uh, Fernando Zegers is, is, is the, 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 has the lead in this and is the first author of these publications. They have been revised for several years. Uh, I've been present at, at several of those uh, meetings and discussions. Uh, um, the definition of live birth, I often ask when I give a lecture to the audience, what do you, what do you think uh, uh, live birth means? You have different opinions. Uh, but here what it shows is that live birth under these, uh, is, is now defined as uh, uh, a, a, a child being born with signs of life after 20 weeks of com completed gestation. 22 weeks uh, signs of life. And for the ones amongst us, uh, there are not many probably, who are still involved in obstetrics or keep up with obstetrics, they know that this has nothing to do with a healthy child. Uh, uh, I would say in most, most conditions, the best that would happen to a child born after 22 weeks of amenorrhea with evidence of life is die. Because the morbidity of the surviving children being born so early is tremendous, is really tremendous. So if we would define an endpoint of our interventions closer to a healthy child, would that not be a significant improvement? We should think of further how that should be done. Of course, I, I have my own ideas about this, uh, which I'm not going to dwell on uh, today. I would only like to make you aware that I personally feel that life birth as a definition of outcome is not good enough. Then cost, uh, and this was part of a mini review series published in Fertility Sterility, which I uh, chaired, and I asked some people to, to, to assess global uh, uh, cost uh, and affordability of IVF. And it's not surprising that they have done a pretty sophisticated, uh, uh, they didn't just look at the money, but they looked at affordability, which is the cost of treatment in relation to the annual income uh, of people. And there you see that the affordability, if you compare this to arrows, uh, the US and the Netherlands, that affordability of IVF in the Netherlands in, is tenfold better compared to the US. And we know that in the United States, uh, IVF is very expensive. There are only very few states, it's increasing, but still few states where it's covered by health insurance. So therefore, it's only the couples that have uh, uh, quite a significant amount of money that can afford to undergo IVF. Uh, and therefore, even in the US, the uptake of IVF in the general population is very low because very few people can, can uh, afford it. And again, think about this, that how does it relate to success? You know, if you have a very good treatment, which only very few people can actually uh, get, is that still part of success uh, for treatment, yes or no? And of course, that, re that, that results in, it, it, uh, money of course is, is the main driver for IVF being available, and this is, uh, uh, also a paper from Silke Daya and Human Reproduction, uh, ICMART uh, report on IVF in the world, and where you compare the number of IVF cycles per number of inhabitants, uh, you see at the very bottom in this uh, data set, uh, Indonesia is the lowest, and Lebanon is the highest. Uh, but look at the, the, the amount, the, the difference, 16 versus almost three and a half Thousand. So there's a thousand fold difference of availability of IVF comparing the lowest and the higher. And of course, that means in the low, there's under treatment, 
maybe in the very high countries there's no treatment. So. Then, uh, if we would agree on a live birth or a better uh, uh, parameter uh, related to healthy children, uh, then um, the next question would be, per what? Improved live birth per what? And I really would like to think, to make you think about this in, in, in greater detail. Uh, in the earlier days, it was often pregnancies per embryo transfer. Of course, if you have two events that are very close together, uh, your, your, your absolute number will be very high. If you talk about a positive pregnancy test uh, per embryo transfer, that's usually very, very high, certainly if you transfer multiple embryos. But now I think it's more and more that people say, you know, we look at per started cycle. So if you start with an IVF uh, uh, cycle, then you look at pregnancy. But then it's almost always, and I think certainly in the in the big uh, regional registries exclusively, people look at pregnancy rates per fresh embryo transfer. And then of course you encourage multiple embryo transfer uh, because if you look at per transfer, for sure, your pregnancy rate will be higher if you transfer two or three compared to one embryo. When you look at outcomes per fresh embryo transfer, if you would look at outcomes per cumulative embryo transfers from the same, from a single cycle and from the same harvest, so fresh and uh, frozen uh, embryo transfer, then you will see that cumulative outcomes are fairly similar because you may lose a little bit on your fresh transfer, but when you try to preserve more uh, good quality embryos, you will have more added value in subsequent uh, uh, frozen thawed embryo transfer. So I think that's a major benefit uh, from looking at it. So you, there's no incentive anymore to transfer as many fresh embryos as you want if you look at cumulative per harvest. But, and already we discussed this uh, uh, in 2004, why do we even look at a given outcome for a single cycle only? Why not do we look at outcomes over a given period of time when you start with a treatment? So, and again, this is still in IVF very, very uncommon, this way of uh, thinking. So I would like you to understand uh, the pros, but also the cons of cumulative outcomes. Uh, first, you have to appreciate where these cumulative outcomes that I showed you before here in the, in the, in the slide, uh, and we all now are, are used to looking at these, uh, this, this is actually coming from cancer survival curves, this kind of statistics. And therefore it's also called, referred to as life table analysis, Kaplan-Meier proportional hazard. Uh, and what this means is you start with 100% of patients, uh, for instance, uh, uh, women with breast cancer, and then you look at survival five years or ten years later. We all know this kind of statistics, uh, and people evaluate different treatment interventions by looking at these five-year or ten-year survival rates. Uh, and from a statistical point of view, when you start with this 100% on your left-hand side, uh, only two things can happen in a survival curve, in a life table analysis. You either stay alive or you pass away. It's a black and white situation. You stay in or you're a dropout uh, because you pass away, because you die. In infertility, it is very, very different. When you talk about cumulative statistics, uh, you can drop out because you are pregnant, but also you, are, you can be advised to refrain from further treatment because you had a poor response and you have a poor prognosis. Uh, People refrain, they, they don't continue with treatment because of treatment burden and stress. Uh, uh, people can not continue treatment because they don't have the money if you have to pay themselves. They move to other clinics, uh, they divorce. So there are very, very diverse reasons for dropping out. And from a statistical point of view, this is called censoring dropouts. And how do you censor? Because you can imagine if you start with 50 patients 
and either you get pregnant or you are advised not to continue with the treatment, at the end of the day, all the patients that remain in your program will get pregnant. Because if not, you kick them out. So, so this is a way to maneuver and to manipulate, uh, if you wish, uh, the cumulative outcomes. Uh, and therefore, people have introduced the term optimistic or pessimistic. And optimistic means that you don't look at the dropouts, uh, you only look at the patients that remain in the trial. And then you get very high numbers. And pessimistic, in, in reality, it means pessimistic. If you start with 100 patients, you only look over a given period of time which proportion of those patients uh, did get pregnant. But again, this does not represent differences in, in outcomes. This just represents different in, way, in, in how you calculate cumulative outcomes. Please uh, remind this. So here you see one example, uh, a paper, uh, a retrospective analysis uh, in the New England, uh, where they actually gave the data of a single center retrospective. Uh, and here you see if they calculate in the optimistic manner, they come to a cumulative uh, probability of life birth of 72% and conservative 51%. Again, it's, it, this is the same data, but it's just calculated in a different way. We have done, uh, I think, the first prospective uh, randomized control trial where we compared two different uh, treatment strategies, uh, mild and conventional, I will not go in detail, but looked at cumulative outcomes over a given period of time. So we start with IVF in the Dutch system at the time, three cycles were reimbursed, uh, so and we just looked over time in the, sorry, Mistake. This slide uh, uh, emphasizes that cumulative outcomes uh, is used very often in other areas in infertility care, like polycystic ovary syndrome and ovulation induction. We have worked on this a lot. I will not go in details, but this gives you the cumulative outcomes of singleton life birth with ovulation induction strategies. And you see it goes up to 70-80%. Nobody questions these kind of data in the area of PCOS and ovulation induction. Everybody is used to look at cumulative outcomes. Uh, also, when you talk about IUI or expected management, everybody is used to look at cumulative outcomes. This is a, a Lancet paper from a Dutch uh, group where they compared uh, hyperstimulation uh, for unexplained. And, and here you see it is cumulative outcomes over time. No question about it. But in IVF, in this particular study that we published, we were heavily criticized by looking at cumulative outcomes in IVF. I still don't understand why, if it concerns IVF, all of a sudden people have a problem. So we, we, we said, this is how we designed the study. It was a prospective randomized comparative trial that, that we said, you know, why not uh, uh, look at what's happening over a given period of time and not so much per cycle or per embryo transfer. So it's possible, it's feasible, and it has been uh, done, a lot of publication of ours. And only when you look at cumulative outcomes, you can also look at dropouts. Uh, we published this uh, separately in human reproduction just one year uh, later, where you see that two different interventions over time gives different uh, uh, dropouts uh, because one treatment was more burdensome to patients than others. Again, no time to go into details, but I want you to make you realize that dropouts uh, and why people drop out and, and when you can, how to, how to affect dropouts really also affect your cumulative pregnancy rates over time. This is uh, another New England paper from the US group. This is SART data, and I only want to show you this to, 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 to emphasize that next to at the conservative life birth rate for cumulative treatments in the US, and you see it's about 55, 60%, so not, not much higher really than in, than in Europe, but also on your right-hand side, you see over the year, the discontinuation rate. So this is dropouts, which is 30, 40%. So in the US, 30 to 40% of women do not continue subsequent IVF uh, treatment. Uh, think about if you could reduce your dropouts uh, of course, that your cumulative pregnancy rates will increase. 
this is a very general uh, 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 way of looking at, at uh, interventions, developments in, in medicine. I like to show this, uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this, the Gardner hype curve. So when you uh, come with something new, and of course in infertility we are more than aware of this, usually in the beginning there's a much enthusiasm. That everybody's saying, wow, this is something, you know, from now on we're going to really improve uh, uh, the, uh, the care, the IVF care we deliver. Uh, but then after a given period of time, you will have some reservations and then at the peak of inflated expectations. I think it's beautifully put. Uh, and then usually subsequent studies show that it doesn't work or it's harmful. Think about the whole aneuploidy, uh, uh, embryo aneuploidy discussion, the PGTA. And, and then th th then you have a, no, and the, the resolution is low, and then at the end, uh, interventions will find uh, its way. Or, you know, at the end it will show that it's really beneficial. Some IVF examples, single embryo transfer, I think there has been delay and resistance from the very beginning, but now I think everybody agrees that this is a good way to go. Blesses this culture agonist bolus, vitrification. So there are developments that really can say, you know, after the peak expectations will continue to be high and accepted now. There are questionable uh, developments in the freeze-all uh, alternative culture system, but also there are many developments that turn out to be not so very helpful in terms of improving outcomes. Time-lapse, uh, PGTA, many add-ons, endometrial scratching, uh, so this brings me to a very, I would say, contagious discussion about add-ons. I'm not sure whether you're aware of this and whether this, is this, this discussion is the same intensity in different parts of the world, but certainly in the, in the United Kingdom, this has been heavily debated. Uh, uh, it turns out that uh, also IVF is practiced uh, in the private setting, predominantly in, in the UK, and many, many patients were advised uh, and were to, to go for add-ons and were charged for add-ons. Uh, and the HFEA finally said, yeah, but can you charge for procedures where there's no clear evidence? And they came up with a strategy of a traffic light. Uh, so red means there's no evidence that is beneficial. Amber means conflicting, we're not sure yet. Uh, and green is uh, that RCT has really proven that it's beneficial. And when you look at it, uh, in the green uh, uh, line, there is none. So none of the add-ons that we advise to our patients quite often uh, have been really been proven. And we, again, have written an editorial about this because it also means what is successful IVF, but also how do you measure improvements? Uh, should it be RCTs only or are uh, other research methodology also suitable uh, to improve, to, to study this? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming towards my conclusion, and it's not an easy message, I understand that. Uh, how should we define IVF? So I think we have to realize that it's a, it's, it has to do with a numerator and a denominator. And it, there are many different numerators, we talked about it, uh, uh, life birth, and we should even maybe take it one step further and talk about term life birth, that would already be a major improvement, or healthy children. And then, of course, you have the discussion how to define healthy children. But then the numerator per, per what? Not per embryo transfer, not per oversight retrieval, not per startup cycle, looking at fresh transfer only. So now we are getting to startup cycle cumulative, fresh and frozen. But I would like you to consider to talk about outcomes per started treatment, so which might involve multiple cycles. When you look uh, what we sort of did 15 years ago, but now in greater detail about the studies being published in terms of numerator and denominator, uh, it, it is now shown scientifically. This is a systematic review. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this uh, published a couple of years ago where you see the numerator and the denominator vary tremendously. So even in prospectively designed RCTs, uh, there is very, very little agreement 
on how outcome of IVF should be assessed. So one step uh, away from the data, uh, we should find, in my view, an optimal balance in infertility care. This is for IVF, but other areas as well. So we should consider burden of treatment, safety of treatment for women and for children, this in relation to time to pregnancy, and, there, and, and, and next to that, uh, in relation to cost and access to care. And my last slide, uh, that we have to realize that the way we practice IVF uh, is not just based on science, uh, but based on context. Of course, if we are in the midst of uh, the continent of Africa, if we perform IVF, uh, compare that to the way we perform IVF, uh, for instance, in a very competitive uh, uh, area like in Massachusetts, in the US, uh, of course, it is very different. And why? Because we assess outcomes differently. Do we focus on pregnancy rates uh, uh, predominantly? Is cost important? Uh, or do we focus on safety and, and, and access to care? So I hope this uh, sharing of thoughts has been useful for you. Uh, and, and please think about this yourself and make up your own mind. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Bart, for an excellent talk, as usual. I tried to summarize a few of the comments and the question, and maybe very shortly, if you can comment on it. Um, IVF is basically safety and success rate. What do you think about artificial intelligence and machine learning in the field of IVF? As we know, it's all coming in. And what do you think about the automated lab? as if we try to save cost and increase the safety of the procedure? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. And, and, and I do have uh, my own opinion on this, uh, but don't ask me for the evidence uh, yet, but I think the evidence will come. Number one, it will, uh, I'm, I'm a strong believer of this development, uh, uh, and I think it's going to come. And I think 10 years from now, everybody will use it, and then it's a no-brainer. Uh, uh, there may be some room for, for improvement of outcomes, because it will make the treatment more consistent. Uh, um, of course, in the beginning, it will be more expensive, but at the end of the day, it will improve uh, 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 health economics when you do it uh, all. And, it will certainly be more safe in terms of you control the environment better, you have a consistent uh, system uh, that is using the same algorithm all the time, and certainly with current technology and, 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 and algorithms and, and artificial intelligence, uh, of course, the, the, the system will improve itself. And then you can more focus on individualized, you can monitor the embryos uh, with all the proteomics, uh, so you can look at the quality of the embryos, you can assess uh, culture media, uh, optimize culture media, and how it affects implantation rates, uh, pregnancy complications, children outcome. So I'm a strong believer, uh, but also I can understand it will take a while in terms of development, but also it will generate some resistance uh, because uh, it will take over a lot of the things that are done by hand uh, now. And another one. Um, our clinic is composed of most of our clinic is 40 40% uh, of our patients are 40 age and above. And what do you think about age limit? Should this include any other parameters like a matrix of age? And until actually, when should we treat the patients? Ooh, yeah, that's that's a difficult one. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, um, I can only make some general statements. Uh, I think AMH may may be of help, but we all know that it did not completely live up to the promise uh, uh, it had uh, ten years ago. So there are technical issues. Uh, there may also be difference in context. Uh, for instance, different patient populations throughout the world 
may have different AMH concentrations. Uh, uh, there are assay issues, uh, uh, but overall, uh, um, we know that we will have more and more women being treated for IVF with a more advanced reproductive age. Uh, uh, I think the bottom line question is here as well, we should not dictate what to do. We should counsel and give uh, 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 realistic information about uh, prospects uh, and decide together with the, with the patients what is most relevant uh, for them. And I honestly believe that in many of those cases, uh, outside donation should be a very realistic alternative. Uh, so in my view, the need for outside donation and the need for outside donors Will even will, will increase further uh, in, in the years to come. Okay, Mark. Thank you very much for your time. It was really excellent, and I hope that we'll be able to go back to normal life here in Israel, the Netherlands, Europe, and the rest of the world pretty soon. And thank you again. Thank you, Zef, and thank the audience uh, for listening. I would love to hear their feedback.